Welcome everyone um, to this event. Um, my name is Kelly Stathis. I am Data Science Technical Community Manager, and I'm joined by my colleagues, Jali Chen, Helena Kuzain, and Arashio Puebla from Data Site. Um, today we'll be talking about the Data Site Metadata Schema and its history, including how it intersects with work done um, by RDA. We really wanna thank RDA for hosting this event um, and for, you know, providing the ideas for having the session as part of the 10th anniversary um, events. And so for questions in this, we will use the chat feature in Zoom um, and we'll try to answer those um, kind of in the chat throughout as well as we'll have some time at the end for Q&A. And so for today, we'll cover um, the basics of the metadata schema, give everyone context, introducing that, um, the schema properties. And then I will walk through the, the history of the schema and how it's been developed throughout um, data sites history with the metadata working group. And we'll take a quick break. The session is an hour and a half long. And then we'll focus on, from the repository perspective, how repositories can contribute robust metadata to data site, um, including the use of various recommended and optional properties and making connections to other PIDs in data site metadata. We'll also look at ways that anyone can access data site metadata using our APIs and services, and then some of the intersections between RDA and data site over the years, as well as what's next for the metadata schema. With that, I will hand things over to Helena to talk about the schema and introduce it to everyone. Thanks, Kelly. Hi, everyone. Really great to uh, have a chance today here to talk about the data site metadata schema. and. I will start with a quick introduction to data site and to the schema. I think probably if you're here today, you already know what data site is because that's probably also where you're interested in hearing more about the schema. Um, but yeah, still wanted to mention that data site is a global nonprofit membership organization. And we work with over 2,900 repositories around the world to provide DOIs for their research outputs and resources. Um, we're a global community, um, so we work with organizations, more than 1,300 organizations in uh, 51 countries that have registered uh, over 56 million DOIs at this point for a wide range of research outputs. So data science vision uh, is to connect research to advance knowledge, and the way in which we connect research is through metadata. And that's also why metadata and the metadata schema are such an important part of what we do. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Um, so our members, when they uh, join data site, they get access to our services and they then have the ability to register DOIs for their research outputs. And when they register DOI, they always have to register metadata um, with information about the resource um, that they're registering, registering a DOI for. Uh, and to do that, to um, register the metadata, they use the data site metadata schema. And so the schema is a list of core metadata properties uh, that, was, that were chosen for accurate and consistent identification of a resource for citation and retrieval purposes along with recommended use instructions. And while well, you'll hear a lot more about what that actually looks like, but the reason we have a schema is that it provides standardization, which allows users to search across metadata and thereby increases interoperability. If everyone would just describe uh, the output in you know, whichever way they felt was appropriate, it would be really hard to aggregate or search for something. And that's why we try to standardize through the schema. And next slide. Um, so uh, the data site metadata schema was developed and is maintained by uh, the data site metadata working group. And the data site metadata working group is a very active group. It consists of 10 to 16 uh, representatives of data site member organizations, plus uh, some data site staff members that also contribute. And it's chaired by two representatives of member organizations. Um, they meet monthly and they all also collaborate asynchronously. As I said, it's a very active group that really actively works on the development of the schema. And there's an open call for nominations at the end of the calendar year. I think Kelly will also mention this later, but if you think, oh, I'm very interested in this, the call is actually open right now. So there is a chance uh, for you to, uh, to join the Metadata Working Group. 
Next slide. Um, so uh, how the group works is they don't just come together and think of things they want to do with the scheme. Uh, we really look at our community and the broader community for input on what are important things to have included in the schema. And so all community members can contribute suggestions. Uh, there's a process for that, uh, which is available on the website. I think Paul will probably put a link in the, in the chat for you to look at. And so anyone can contribute suggestions if you think this is missing or this should be different, or I would be better able to describe my resource if I had these fields, then you can make that suggestion. And the data site team then reviews and assesses the priority, tries to see, is this something you know that's more broadly of interest? We have a community discussion to get more information. And then the data site metadata working group looks at it, tries to see how could this actually be implemented? And if they see it as something that uh, they would like to take forward, uh, it's shared with the community for more detailed feedback so that we really know when we work on changes to the schema that there's broad community support. We know it's possible to implement and it will be useful to a wide range of users of the schema. Next slide. Ah. Okay, that was me for now. Then I'll hand over to uh, my colleague, Shaoli. Thanks, Helena, for that the, for the introduction. And uh, I will be giving an overview of the properties and the various forms uh, the schema presents itself. So first, uh, this is the current metadata schema uh, properties. Now it contains 20 properties. Uh, it's here presented in three categories, the mandatory, recommended, and optional. The mandatory properties are these six, uh, identifier, creator, title of the resource, the publisher who like host, distribute, uh, and preserve that resource, uh, the publication year, and the resource type. These are uh, the, the core metadata values you have to provide in order to obtain a DOI to be assigned to it. And then we have the uh, recommended ones, including the subject area uh, this resource fall into, the uh, all of the contributors that is uh, involved in creating or managing or maintaining that resource, the various dates that is re relevant to this resource. The related identifier are uh, other works of resources that uh, have uh, various uh, types of relations to this particular resource and the description as well as the geolocation uh, of that resource. This um, uh, applies uh, when, when it applies. Uh, and then you have the optional uh, uh, properties, including language, alternate, alternate identifier, size, format, version, rights, funding reference, uh, and related item uh, rel uh, uh, element. So what does it mean, the require, sorry, uh, I'm still on that slide. Uh, so I just wanted to emphasize, uh, so why we give this different, uh, you know, the man man uh, mandatory recommended optional category, it doesn't, it doesn't really indicate the importance of the element. All of the elements are very important as descriptors to the resource. But um, so like, uh, as I mentioned, the required ones are, uh, you know, this, needs to be there for the DOIs to be assigned. And the recommended ones are recommended because they are important for various very common use cases, for example, subjects for landscape analysis and related identifier for the PID graph, which I will come back to uh, later. And, uh, and the uh, optional properties are those that may ap only apply to specific context or resource type, but having them will substantially improve the discoverability of the resource. So they are still very important. So the, the takeaway message is, is if you have that value like available, they should go into the metadata uh, like record. Um, yeah, now we can go to the next slide. Uh, so yeah, and also uh, the schema structure as mentioned, mandatory recommended optional, properties and some of the some properties can be repeated in fact most properties can be repeated the non-repeatable properties are the identifier they are unique uh, and automatically assigned so there's only one for each resource the publisher there can be only one publisher for a resource the publication year you cannot publish it 
in multiple years, uh, and the resource type as well as the version. These are non-repeatable uh, uh, properties for resource, and all of the rest can be repeated in various uh, capacities. And some of the pro uh, properties have controlled list values. Others allow free text for a specific format, like dates. And also there is a hierarchical structure presented um, because they have sub properties and attributes associated to it. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, so the traditional way of submitting metadata to data site is to create uh, to submit an XML file uh, that contained all of this metadata uh, elements in it. And this uh, is how it presents, how it looks like encoded in an XML. Uh, it represents its elements, uh, sub elements, as sub properties, and attributes uh, to the sub, sub elements. So that's a hierarchical uh, structure we're talking about. And uh, here is, uh, is Sophia Garcia as a creator as a person and a creator. It's not an algorithm called <laughs> Sofia Garcia. So yeah, uh, next slide. And uh, there's a REST API return information about data comments uh, in JSON format. So the API is RESTful uh, and, and that the JSON uh, meta is mapped into the JSON format and follows the JSON API specifications. Next slide. And here is a at a glance view of all of the mandatory properties for a data site DOI. So it doesn't look a lot. This contains all the six mandatory properties, uh, including the DOI string itself, uh, the name of the creator, um, the name type, uh, language, uh, the, title, the title of the resource and the title language, uh, the publisher, uh, publish, publication year and uh, the resource type combined with the resource type general um, property. Um, and so as my, uh, men Helena mentioned, uh, the SI schema is suitable for many resource types. In principle, uh, any resource type we would encounter in a scholarly setting. So when you use the resource type general and the resource type property in combination, these are uh, two properties, one with control list, and one is a sub property with free text where you can specify which, which type of uh, resource that is. Um, and currently this controlled list, the resource type general uh, has 28 uh, terms that we support. And this is partially due to the wider discussion in the data publishing and data citation communities at the beginning of the open science and data sharing. Uh, movement. So on what constitutes research data, well, apparently it's not just, you know, a, num a table with numbers in it. Uh, any type of resource can be deemed as a primary or secondary data source for research and, uh, and hence uh, the various resource types, which is a perfect segue to the next section of the presentation on history of the data metadata schema. Hey, thanks, Lee. Um, so yeah, for this next part of the session, I will go through some of the history of the schema um, and the metadata working group and how this has evolved over time. Um, and just before I get started on this, I really like to thank Jan Ashton from the British Library. Um, she is one of the current metadata working group co-chairs, and she was she's been an integral part of the group from its incep inception. And she also really helped to develop some of the content in these slides that I'm about to present, including filling me in on the earliest metadata working group history here. So we're currently on version four, version 4.4 of the metadata schema, which was released in March, 2021. And we are about to release version 4.5. And this timeline shows all of the schema versions to date, starting with the earliest draft in 2009. And so the first few versions here um, were essentially early drafts that were released for public comment. So this is true for version 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and 1.0. Following that version two, was the culmination of those drafts in 2011, and this was the first version implemented in data site systems. Since then, we've had two more major versions, version three in 2013 and version four in 2016, with, of course, several minor versions in between. The Metadata Working Group was founded in 2009, and it was one of the data site technical working groups 
um, with, with representatives from Australia, the US, Canada, and Europe. And the aim of the group was to develop a minimum set of metadata properties that were acceptable and suitable for all data site members with a simple generic structure that applied across disciplines and organizations and was clearly defined in order to aid in mapping to other schemas. When the group had their first video conference meeting in September of 2009, the outcome was the first draft of the schema or version 0.1. And this was closely based off of the schema used by the German National Library of Science and Technology or TIB, um, which was the first DUI registration agency for data from 2005 to 2009 and one of the co-founders of DataCite. So following this work, the group met in person the following year um, and agreed on six required properties. And I've included a quote here um, from a blog post that the working group's first chair, Joan Starr, um, wrote summarizing this meeting. I won't read the full quote out, um, but I'll highlight this part. A standard that can accommodate a wide range of use cases and users is more successful than one that is more narrowly defined. When our discussions bumped into the edges of disagreement, we were able to uncover assumptions, clearing up misconceptions. And I think this really rings true today, and that the role of the metadata working group is to understand and support a wide range of use cases and all users of data site DOIs. And a key part of this work is uncovering those assumptions that we make so that the schema can serve the entire data site community as best as possible. And this brings us to version 1.0, which was finalized and shared for public comment in August of 2010. This version isn't published because it was, again, really more of a precursor or early draft of what became version 2.0. Um, and so before, um, before publishing version 2.0, the Metadata Working Group made several changes following community review. They renamed the subject property, which in the earlier version 1.0 draft was discipline. They removed a proposed requirement to use exclusively the, the Dewey Decibel classification for subject terms, which I think in retrospect was a very wise decision. They scaled back the list of supported resource types from an original 53 options to just 11. And they removed an optional property that was in version one um, publication place. And all of these changes happened before the scheme that was implemented in data site services. Therefore, we don't have any version 1.0 records demonstrating this draft schema. And so Following this version two um, was published in January, 2011. And this was the first version implemented in data site systems. And I've included here a reference to an article by Joan Starr and Angela Gassel, who are both part of the working group. And this summarizes the schema and its intended purpose, which I do wanna dig into a bit before we look at version 2.0 itself. So the authors wrote that the data site metadata schema was designed to support data set citation and discovery. And they also listed several objectives for the schema, which are still relevant today. There is this intention to develop a recommended citation format for data sets, an emphasis on interoperability with other data management schemas, a focus on data set discovery and relationship metadata, and the idea that the use of controlled terms in the schema was important to lay the groundwork for future services. I found this really interesting to look back on because even though data sites present focus extends far beyond data sets as stated here, these objectives are still very relevant for the schema and all of the resource types that we support. So now I'm gonna go through each of the versions briefly and show kind of what's changed over time with the schema. And so starting with version 2.0, here is the original list of properties. There were five mandatory properties, identifier, creator, title, publisher, and publication year, plus 12 optional properties. And all of these were, the, all these properties are still in the current version of the schema. None of these have been deprecated. And the resource type property um, had, an, and still has an attribute, resource type general, with a controlled list of terms that data site maintains. Um, we showed the, the current list earlier. Um, in version two, there were 11 allowed values, which are listed here, collection, data set, event, film, image, interactive resource, physical object, service, software, sound, and text. So following version two later in 2011, there were two minor updates to the schema. Version 2.1 introduced some technical changes, added a namespace, and it enforced that mandatory properties had to have content inside them. 
And then in version 2.2, there were some additions to control lists. The metadata working group expanded the options for contributor type. They added a new resource type general for models, added support for URLs as related identifiers, and added a new description type for series information. And both of these minor updates, they kept the overall structure of the schema the same. So neither of these added new properties or sub properties. The next schema release was a major version. This is version 3.0. And version three included a new geolocation property with sub properties for points, bounding boxes, and free text place names. The rights property was also made repeatable in this version. And because of how the XML was structured, this made version three the first version to introduce changes that were not backward compatible, meaning that valid the metadata that was valid under schema three um, wouldn't be valid under schema two. Another key feature of version three was the addition of several new attributes for URIs. So rights URI for rights, scheme URI for name identifiers and subjects, um, with both of these changes intended to improve the interoperability of the schema. Related identifier also had new attributes added to support references to a related metadata scheme, which were to be used with a new relation type has metadata. And this relation type can be used to link a DOI to an external metadata record for the same resource, which is useful for connecting DOIs, for example, to domain specific metadata that's hosted elsewhere. In addition to this relation type has metadata, there were several other additions to control lists, um, which are listed on this slide. Three new contributor types, other project manager and resource group, research group, a new date type collected, uh, three new resource types, um, audiovisual, other, and workflow, new related identifier type, PMID or PubMed ID, new relation types for is identical to, and then the has metadata and is metadata for pair, and also a new description type for methods information. So and then in version 3.1 the following year, the key change was to add an affiliation set property to the creator and contributor properties. And at the time, this allowed users to provide a free text string for affiliation, for example, of a university. There were, again, several more terms added to control lists here, a new contributor type data curator, two new related identifier types for archive and bib code identifiers, um, and new relation types again. So is reviewed by and reviews and is derived from and is source of. Two years after this, in 2016, version 4.0 was released. And a critical change in this version was changing resource type from optional to mandatory and requiring the resource type general attribute. And so this means that every data site DOI registered using version 4.0 or later must have a resource type general from that control list of terms. Version four also added a new funding reference property. And along with this, they deprecated um, a previous contributor type funder. Several sub properties were added to existing properties too. Um, geolocation polygon was added to geolocation. Given name and family name sub properties were added to creator, creator and contributor. And a value URI sub property was added to subject. This version also expanded control lists once again to add a new title type, other, a new related identifier type IGSN, and a new description type technical info. Oops. Um, so the next minor version, again, added more sub properties focused on support for software DOIs this time. And so the new sub properties were name type for creator and contributor, date information for date, resource type general for related identifier. And this allows users to specify the type of the related resource and in polygon point for geolocation polygon. Um, this version also included several changes to the documentation to make the definitions more inclusive of software and support software citation. Control lists were expanded too, including some new values for relation type that were added with software specifically in mind. So has version and is version of, and is required by and requires, thinking about software requirements there. There's also a new date type other and a resource type general data paper included here. Version 4.2 added new sub properties for rights metadata to capture a rights identifier. And there were again a handful of additions to control lists, a new date type withdrawn, a new related identifier type W3ID, and a new relation type pair is obsoleted by and obsoletes. 
Next, version 4.3 added affiliation identifiers to the creator and contributor properties. And this was an expansion of the affiliation subproperty that was added in 3.1. Um, and around this time, the research organization registry, or ROAR, was starting to gain traction to represent researcher affiliations. At the same time, we also expanded the control list for funder identifier type to add ROAR as an option. Um, and then that brings us to version 4.4, which is the most recently supported version. And version 4.4 added a new related item property um, for structured relationship information. And this enables representation of related resource that, resources that don't have an identifier. Um, and previously this wasn't possible because the only option was the related identifier property for a related resource. This version also included the largest expansion of resource type general to date, adding, new 13, adding 13 new terms to the list. And most of these are for text-based resources, and these could be considered subtypes of the existing term text. Um, and this adds more specificity to the schema here. Related to this change is also adding the relation type is published in. And this was designed to be used with the related item property to indicate publication information in a structured way. Um, we previously recommended series information for this and having a um, certain text structure for series information. Um, this splits it up into dedicated fields. So for example, if you have a DOI for a book chapter, you can indicate that it's published in a book using this mechanism and state the book's author, title, et cetera, in the related item fields. Finally, we also added a new classification code sub property to subject. And this is recognizing that for some subject vocabularies, um, they don't have a resolvable value URI, but they do have a unique classification code, which can now be supplied. And this brings us to version 4.5, which is currently being prepared for release. Our engineering team is actively working on this at the moment. And this will add support for publisher identifiers, very similar to how version 4.3 added support for affiliation identifiers. And it also adds some new control list terms to support DOIs for instruments and study registrations. So for example, pre-registrations and registration reports. And we will walk through these changes in more detail towards the end of this session. And so to sum up these changes, I think we can say that while the data site metadata schema has greatly expanded to represent more resource types, the focus on citation and discovery of research remains central to the schema. And so over time, we've made several changes to represent connections between research entities better, including adding new ways to link DOIs to other PIDs using the schema. So for example, funder identifier, affiliation identifier, and soon publisher identifier. Um, and so before we take a break here, I do wanna show this short animation that my colleague Paul made. It shows data site DOI registration over time segmented by resource type. Let's play here. Yeah, so you'll notice here the, the earliest DOIs in our metadata store were registered prior to 2009, and these were ones that were transitioned from TIB to data site. And another thing that you might see as this progresses is that some of the resource types appearing in this list um, are showing up before they were added to the schema. And this is because repositories can update metadata retroactively to take advantage of new resource types, which we encourage. So here you're seeing journal article before 4.4. This again showing growth of various types here. They're color coded by the version they were added. Launch the Make Data Count initiative. Um, and here we're seeing with 4.0 growth again. Um, and leading up here, because it's going to happen pretty quickly, um, see with the IGSN initiative launching, there's about to be a really rapid growth in the physical object resource type. Um, and this is as the IGSN IDs were re-registered with data site um, and added to our metadata store. So we'll share the link to this in the chat um, if you want to check it out. Um, I thought this was a cool way to show the growth over time of different resources. And that's playing again. And I didn't mean to do that. All right. Um, so we'll take a, a 10 minute break. We'll come back at 10 minutes after the hour, just kind of going a little breather. Um, and then we'll pick up the session. Thanks everyone for joining us.
All right, I'll pick back up here, the next part of the session. Um, so for this next part, we are going to talk about how um, repositories that register data site DOIs can contribute robust metadata and make the most of the data site schema. And so when repositories register DOIs and they provide metadata, there are two areas to focus on for metadata completeness. First, we encourage including the recommended and optional properties for improved resource description. Um, and today I'll cover some tips for using the subject, description, language, and rights properties. Another aspect is adding what we call connection metadata to demonstrate links to other works, people, and organizations. And this can be achieved through some of the optional and recommended properties as well. Um, for example, the related identifier property for related resources um, and other sub properties, including name identifier, affiliation identifier, and funder identifier. So as a refresher, there are 20 metadata properties in the schema, as Lee mentioned. And so these are classified as mandatory, recommended, or optional. Um, and as I said in the chat, the difference between recommended and optional, um, practically they're all optional and we recommend including as much as is relevant for the resource. I think with the recommended, the idea is that these are generally going to apply to most resources. So it's a bit stronger than optional. Um, but really when you're describing anything with a DOI, um, the idea is to include as much as possible for metadata completeness. Um, and so, yeah, just because we don't have time to cover all the properties today, um, we'll focus on the four that are in bold here. So we'll look at subject, description, language, and rights in this section. And so with the subject property, um, this can be used for any subject, keyword, classification code, or key phrase describing the resource. And subjects are of course really critical for discovery and help to contextualize resources. And this has some optional sub properties that are helpful to include um, when you're using a controlled vocabulary or a classification scheme. And so in this example, um, with a Library of Congress subject heading, um, Library of Congress subject headings would be the classification scheme. Um, and then you would include the link to the authority record in the value URI field. And you can see how this is structured in the XML here. And so the subject property is flexible, allowing users to specify any subject scheme for the subject term. Unlike in that version 1.0 draft, it does not limit you to do a decimal classification. Um, and you can provide multiple terms here um, and pull from different vocabularies if you wish. And so one source that we do encourage using is the fields of science and technology classification from OECD. And this is a broad classification for fields of research. Um, and this is really helpful when performing general bibliometric analysis on DOI metadata. And so you can see here this example, um, we have the fields of subject, um, fields of science, um, and then earth and related environmental sciences as the subject term. Another important property that kind of goes hand in hand with subject is description. And so you can use the description to provide a high level summary of the resource, as well as to include any additional information that doesn't fit elsewhere in the schema. And there are different types of descriptions which can be specified through the description type subproperty. So for example, abstract methods or technical information. The description field is really critical for indexing in search engines and discovery systems. And so for example, with Google dataset search, a dataset has to have a description that's at least 50 characters long along with several other criteria for inclusion. And so you wanna have a description that describes the resource at a high level and includes key search terms that users would um, typically use when trying to find your resource. And so for a guide to data set description specifically, I really like this guide, um, which was shared at an RDA plenary a couple years ago, um, which I think Paul has dropped a link to in the chat. And this one's kind of thinking about what is an abstract for data and how do you describe data well. Another important property for resources that have text is the language property. And language is used to record the primary language of the resource. And this property supports short language codes, um, including, but not only codes from ISO 6391. And so for example, the DOI for this presentation would have language EN for English. So the, the two letter codes from ISO 6391, these are widely recognized and supported, but they don't cover everything. 
Um, so one resource I like to share for selecting language codes is the W3C guidance on language tags. And specifically, they have guidance on using the IANA language subtag registry. And this registry includes codes from different code lists, so primarily the 16, ISO 639 lists, and it aims to recommend the shortest possible specific code for a language. So for example, um, it recommends for English the code EN, um, which would be, you would see that in ISO 6391 as a two-letter code, um, rather than ENG, which you would see in ISO 6393 three-letter code. But for Mandarin Chinese, for example, it would recommend CMN rather than the general code for Chinese languages, ZH. And so because these tags are all valid according to the XML language type, they're all accepted in the dataset metadata schema. And this is true both for the language property itself, um, which is what I showed on the pre previous slide, as well as various places where you can include an XML lang attribute on a property. So for example, if you're indicating the language of a title. And of course, um, you can also refer to the code lists directly. Um, so if you're using ISO 639, 2, or 3 in your repository, um, that's completely fine, rather than using the registry to look up a code. Um, the scheme is not restrictive when it comes to these language tags, and we encourage you to follow international standards and best practices here. So the last property I'll talk about before we look at connection metadata is the rights property. And rights is used for licenses and other rights related characteristics of a resource. We recommend including a license name or right statement, as well as these optional properties that allow referencing specific license um, by an identifier and URI. And this example here shows how you would indicate a Creative Commons attribution license or CC BY 4.0. When referencing a license in the rights property, we do recommend using the XPDX license list. And this list has identifiers for commonly used licenses. You can refer to this list with the rights identifier attributes, as well as to confirm the official full name of the license when you're putting that in the rights property. And we find that using XPDX helps to promote consistency in this property. Um, so we do suggest, for example, um, identifiers and full license names for this if you're using our data site Fabrica interface to register DOIs. Um, that said, the way the property is implemented is flexible, so you can provide a custom license here or a license that is not in the XPDX list. And so those are some tips for the, some of the recommended and optional properties. And with that, I will hand things back over to Lee um, to talk about connection metadata in the data site schema. Well, thanks, Kelly. Um, yeah, and make connect once you have those resources identified. Next step is to give them context and you do that through uh, making connections between them. So next slide, please. Connection metadata is metadata that represents relationships or connections between different entities. For example, you could have connection metadata for a paper citing a data set, a person authoring a paper, person's affiliation with an institution, an institution funding a research project that generates many outputs, or a data set being generated by a piece of software. These are all relations we can represent in metadata. So this metadata help facilitate interoperability between persistent identifiers and persistent identifier systems and open research infrastructure in general. Next slide. Uh, there are a few different places in the data site meta schema where you can provide connections to other persistent identifiers, as Kelly mentioned previously. First, there is a related identifier property. This allows you to make connections to related research outputs. So for example, you could link to an article that says the data set or an earlier version of that data set to this data set you're identifying. So in this field, we ideally want to see a person identifier like another DOI, but you can also put links like an URL uh, if there isn't a person identifier available. There are also a handful of attributes attached to other properties that allows you to add uh, related identifiers, including name identifier for creators and contributors, affiliation identifier for the affiliation of the creator and contributors and funder identifier for the funding references. So creators and contributors have name identifier attribute that can be used to uniquely identify authors and contributors. Uh, for an individual contributor, typically this will be an ORCID ID, 
or for an organization, you might use a rural ID here. Individual creators uh, uh, and contributors can also have affiliation, which are indicated in a separate affiliation identifier property. This would typically be a raw ID for the organization. And the other place where organizations can be included is the funder identifier, where you can make reference to funding organizations. Uh, here you can put uh, the uh, Crossref Open Funder Registry ID. Uh, this has been uh, Crossref has been a provider for identifier for funders for some time now. Uh, this is quite heavily used, but alternatively, you can also provide a raw ID, uh, which makes sense for repositories that are already using raw in other fields. And also considering recently uh, Crossref and Roar jointly announced uh, a roadmap to merging these two registries, the Open Funder Registry and Roar. Uh, if you if a repository haven't started using these, um, like using uh, choosing Roar will be the more future proof uh, option, and uh, it's never too too, uh, too early to start thinking about transitioning if you are using Open uh, uh, Funder Registry IDs. Next slide, please. Uh, and in Design Metadata, we use the related identifier field to capture connection between objects, and these connections represent relationships uh, that is shown on this uh, on this diagram. Um, and this metadata once created, they land in the uh, abstract concept of of a uh, PID graph, where uh, it, this uh, relationships is captured and can be retrieved later on for other use cases. Next slide. Um, so the value when when entering this value to the to uh, when uh, creating the metadata record for the DOI, it should be a full URL for the identifier. So keep the HTTPS uh, colon slash slash DOI dot org slash uh, part of that uh, string if it's a DOI. And the four uh, sub-elements associated with this field, uh, the related identifier type and, uh, and relate, uh, relation type fields are required. And the resource general type and related metadata scheme fields are optional. Not, note that uh, the metadata schema related to sub-elements are only required when the has metadata uh, element and this metadata for relation types are used. Uh, and, uh, sorry, has metadata and is metadata for relation types uh, are used in that in that relation. Um, this are uh, this becomes an option to to be entered. So we will come back to a relation type in a moment. Um, next slide. So currently, the schema supports seventeen types of relations uh, expressed in pairs to distinguish between directions. So uh, the, the relations can be made from both directions, the, the item being referenced and items that's referencing. Um, so barring is identical to and is published and these are, can only happen in one direction. So for the six, sake of easy understanding, we've put them into five concept, conceptual categories. Uh, the citation category, including cites, is cited by, references, is referenced by, and is supplemented to, and is supplemented by. These are arguably the three most important pairs of relations. Uh, but uh, this will come back to in the next slide. But first, let's go through the rest of the relations. Relation in the versioning category are usually ap applied to different manifestation of the same objects. And this includes its new version of, its, its previous version of, uh, has version, is version of, is obsolete by, and obsolete, and is identical to. So con concept, uh, contextualization relations are applied to related objects that provide additional information to the object, like documentation, review, and technical specifications. So this category includes described by, it describes, has metadata, is metadata for, is documented by documents, and is reviewed by reviews. The whole part is a small but versatile category. Uh, this is part of has part relation is sometimes used as a catch-all relation type when no other options are appropriate. 
or the relation type is difficult to specify. In this circumstance, we encourage you to reach out mm -hmm. to the SI team or the Metadata Working Group to provide a description of your use case for the relation type, and this will be valuable reference for us. Um, and the gener uh, generation slash dependencies category catches relationships such as software and code, where you use compile uh, is compiled by compiles relation type and raw and process data mm -hmm. where you can use is source of or is uh, is de derived from relation type and data set and experimental protocol type relations like uh, it's required required by it as well as uh, between like a soft in the software context um, as Kelly mentioned before. Next slide. Um, Citation, uh, arguably the most important and most prevalent used relations between objects is citation and references. Uh, citations and references are links between research outputs. You can add citation and reference to DOI metadata when you're creating the DOI initially and with subsequent updates to the metadata, as we've seen uh, this being done over time, the long tail of uh, research impact happening, which we want to such like uh, capture uh, as much as possible. The data, uh, the table here uh, elaborates on the specific meaning of the relations and how data side process and display the statistics derived from them. And these are quite easily confused. So uh, it's a good idea to put a pin on this slide, make a screenshot of this uh, and find table on data side support site. Um, I'll please put a link. <laughs> um, next slide. And we use name identifier element to represent the relationship between DOI and a creator or contributor identified unambiguously by their ORCID ID. Next slide. Uh, in the name identifier element field, uh, ORCID ID or other person identifiers, creator or contributor is accepted in its full URL format if available. Uh, additionally, name identifier scheme and scheme URI can be defined as sub-elements. Just help with inter uh, interoperating with different types of uh, different uh, type of schemas. Next slide. Um, entering the ORCID reference in in, in data site. Uh, metadata is very useful because this way that a DOI can be automatically added to uh, ORCID records when the name identifier metadata for creators in, uh, includes an ORCID ID. This is given that uh, the ORCID ID holder, the researcher allows platform that integrate uh, with DOI to do this, this uh, to, to insert, to make that insertion to their, uh, to their ORCID record. And this makes the uh, ORCID ID to uh, DOI connection available, not only in data metadata, but also in the ORCID metadata. Um, and moving to the affiliation identifier, uh, affiliation specifically represents the relationship between a creator or a contributor, which can be a people organization and their affiliated organization. Uh, affiliation identifier makes it easy to find research outputs associated with a particular institution. So uh, affiliation identifier is a sub element under the creator and contributor element. The value should be the name of the institution and optionally you can add a affiliation identifier in its full URL format. And if you do that, an affiliation identifier scheme attribute is required to accompany the URL. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see an example of the metadata snippet uh, from data site as affiliation of creator Elizabeth Miller and the ruler ID uh, attached to the affiliation sub-element. In the data schema, affiliation identifier is the organization identifier. Several registries of organization identifier are available. Uh, they are ROAR, they're ISNI, uh, GRID used to be very prevalent use, but it's not, it's discontinued, it's no longer a viable option. Uh, we, are, we recommend ROAR as it's an open and community led registry. And as that is one of the three operating organizations alongside uh, Crossref and California Digital Library. 
So finally, we have the funder identifiers for funding references. Uh, funding reference represent a relationship between a DOI and the funding organization that financially supported the work that resulted in the research output represented by that DOI. Um, the funding reference block contains information on the funder, the funder name, and the funder identifier, so identifier type and scheme, as well as a specific grant or award number, URI, and the title of that grant. Currently, the funder identifier type uh, field has controlled list options, unlike the name and affiliation identifier schemes, which are uncontrolled. So pay attention there. The controlled list options include uh, Crossref open funder registry IDs, uh, GRID, although it's no longer recommended, and ISNI, ROAR, and other. It is under consideration to make creating funding reference more open and allow other uh, scheme here. So it's like uh, uh, being discussed right now, I think. Um, know that also the, yeah, the, the funder, Crossroad funder ID is going to be remain functional for the foreseeable future. As I said, time to consider uh, the future proof option of ROAR and how to transition. <laughs> so, uh, if if this, is, this work is relevant to you, it is quite important, <laughs> but maybe to many, uh, it's not that relevant, but yeah. Um, yeah, so as a summary, uh, connection metadata, uh, is supported in the data uh, set schema through the related identifier, the name identifier, the affiliation identifier, and funder identifier properties. Uh, through this metadata, connections can be established between objects and objects, objects and people, and objects and organizations. So then uh, I will hand it back to, uh, to Kelly. Great, thanks Lee. Um, so yeah, I guess so far this session has been focused on how metadata is provided by data site members and repositories. Um, and so I'm gonna briefly switch gears here to talk about how data site metadata can be accessed or consumed and how harvesters can retrieve data site metadata. So there are several ways to directly access data site DOI metadata or the data site metadata store. Um, we have data site commons, which is our discovery interface. Um, the data site REST API. We have an OAI PMH feed, which is used by harvesters. And we also have a GraphQL API. Data site commons is a um, publicly accessible portal, which allows anyone to search the entire data site metadata catalog and explore connections between DOIs and other PIDs. You can search um, DOIs or works, and this includes all data site DOIs that have the findable state or that are registered with public metadata, um, as well as a large number of Crossref DOIs, specifically those Crossref DOIs that are connected to data site DOIs through relationship metadata. It also has ways to search people, so looking specifically at researchers with ORCID IDs, um, organizations with ROAR IDs, and then also repositories. Um, and their repository search includes both data site repositories as well as repositories that have re 3 data records. Um, and Commons highlights the ways in which these different PIDs intersect. So for example, um, you can see DOIs that are associated with a given researcher's ORCID ID um, or DOIs associated with an organization through a ROAR ID using Commons. So we also have a REST API. Um, and the REST API enables retrieval, creation, and update of data site DOI metadata records and account information. So authenticated users repositories can create and update DOIs, um, but there's also a public um, unauthenticated version of the API where you can retrieve DOI metadata, a query for a list of DOIs using various filters um, and using the Elasticsearch query structure. So for more information on this, we do have a REST API guide. Um, and we also have some REST API training materials, including um, video recording and a Postman collection with example queries. Um, another option that we have, and this is primarily used by harvesters, is our OEI PMH service. Um, and this exposes all the metadata stored in the metadata store using the Open Archives Initiative protocol for metadata harvesting or OEI PMH. Um, and this is, again, mostly used by harvesters and aggregators, 
For more information, if you're interested in using this, you can check out our OAI PMH guide, which gets into some of the specifics of how our implementation works. And then finally, we also have a GraphQL API. Um, and this is the API that powers data site comments. And this is really focused on um, querying the PID graph, right? So it's the connections between the different persistent identifiers, um, scholarly resources. Um, this will expose connections between DOIs. So again, um, data site DOIs, as well as some cross ref DOIs that are connected with data site DOIs, ORCID records, OR records, and RE3 data records. For more information on this, you can check out, we have a GraphQL API guide. Um, and there's also a GraphQL API playground where you can explore the API live online. With that, I think we'll transition to the section about intersections between RDA and data site, and I'll pass it over to Helena to start us off. Yeah, great. Thanks, Kelly. Um, yeah, so the thing I wanted to start with when talking about how, you know, RDA work touches on the metadata scheme or the other way around is um, talk about SCOLIX. SCOLIX stands for Scholarly Link Exchange, uh, and it was developed by the RDA WDS SCOLIX Working Group. Um, and well, if you're active within RDA, I'm sure you've come across it because it's been around for a long time. Um, but SCOLIX is a framework for standardizing the exchange of scholarly link information between scholarly infrastructure providers with a focus on articles and data sets. Uh, it's not an organization or a service. Um, it's really the framework uh, that describes how information can be exchanged. If we go to the next slide, um, the reason... Um, Scolix was developed was that at the time uh, it was already recognized that linking research data with the literature is of great value um, but in many cases th those links weren't being established so if there was data publicly available that was associated with uh, a research article then it was not easy um, to find that information. And also when the link was established, it was often just bi-directional. So a specific publisher working with a specific repository, but it wasn't necessarily available to the broader community. Uh, and that was really uh, what Scolix was looking to address. And if we go to the next slide, um, so the way that was done was to um, develop this framework um, that describes how information can be exchanged, but also uh, to have a number of hubs of which data site uh, is one to which this information can be contributed. Uh, and so data site members using data site DOIs and the metadata they register uh, could use the framework to provide that information uh, in line with the SCOLIX framework to data site and data site then exposes that information. Uh, and um, yeah, on the data site side, um, <laughs> thanks Kelly. Um, this was uh, at the time more focused on getting information about data sets with them publishers contributing that information uh, to Crossref. I think now we work on a broader range of re uh, resource types and so uh, we also see similar information for some other resource types, but um, initially the framework was set up for articles and data sets. Uh, and now if we look at the next slide, um, Xiaoli talked a lot about sort of uh, connection metadata and relation types. And so the SCOLIX framework was based on the data site and Crossref uh, metadata schemas and uh, the terms used there. And so, um, relation types that we recognize uh, in our schema um, are used to connect um, articles and data sets within the SCOLIX framework. And so by submitting um, metadata to data site, describing the relationship between an article and a data set, you are making that available in line with the SCOLIX framework and ensuring it's exposed to the broader community. Um, next slide. So as I said, at the time, this was really very much focused on uh, the link between articles and data sets. Uh, but I think not just data site, but also the broader community has started focusing more on also making uh, different 
research outputs available. And so over the last two years, the Scholix Working Group has done a lot of work uh, on software and seeing how that fits within the framework. And very recently, earlier this year, we decided that actually the Scholix activities will be continued um, as part of the Open Science Graphs uh, interest group because we really want to look at um, connecting all the different entities within the research ecosystem um, through metadata and relationships. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we're really about to get started with these activities under the umbrella of the interest group. So if you're interested in having these conversations, please join uh, our group. I think Paul just pasted a link in the chat. Um, and we'll be meeting soon to um, continue these conversations. Thank you. Right, the ne uh, I'll follow up on that uh, with uh, uh, PIDs for Instrument Working Group at RDA. Um, this is where efforts around uh, how to properly identify research instruments were made. And this is an old group. This was established back in 2017 and a lot of work have poured into it uh, over, the, over the years. And the group has uh, put out uh, their official uh, outputs as a research paper uh, on the data science journal about persistent identific identification of instruments where they included some specification on the uh, metadata elements that should be included. And the data side has been actively involved in this effort uh, with uh, building up and uh, uh, reviewing and proving a crosswalk uh, uh, or like a mapping between the pit inst schema which is the uh the, the schema the working group uh specified and the data side existing data side schema and uh this uh mapping uh will be uh i think launched in in version 4.5 uh, coming up end of the year or beginning of next year uh just means that some members can then identify the instrumentations uh, they host with DSI DOIs using a community endorsed schema. Um, next slide. Uh, then we also involved in the conversation around the integration of uh, open identification system, uh, pitch system with research uh, tools and services out there. And this is the working group that I'm uh, co-chairing the working with PIDs and tools interest group um, together with uh, uh, Rory McNeil from uh, from Research Space is a like electronic uh, lab notebook platform. Uh, Jens Klump, the director of IGS and uh, identifier as well as uh, my co-chair, Christopher Altman. Uh, who's represent the funding funders perspective in the group in the group and uh, we have uh, focused our conversation in this group on how to properly um, operationalize uh, PID and metadata workflows in the research tools and platforms that researchers use in their uh, research pr process. And we have, uh, since beginning of the group, attracted some uh, small funding to put in place actual integrations. And in the past uh, RDA that was just last month, uh, we had a joint session with the National Pit Strategy uh, Interest Group uh, to discuss uh, our overlapping interest, as well as the possible step to a central information exchange repository for PIDs. This is something that emerged from our work and following uh, the integration processes of various tools. Um, next slide. Right, I think it's now my my part. Yeah, so thank you so much, Lee, Kelis, and Helena for, for all the outline. Um, I was just going to take a few moments to speak about another 
important RDA working group that data side has been contributing to, specifically the usage metrics working group. You've already heard about the importance of the relational metadata and how much we care and all the fantastic work that repositories are doing. To contribute this, we believe this is very important, of course, because the, the other side of the coin is that this helps us build the foundation of the knowledge as to how data sets are being used. So the working group was created in 2018, and I want to uh, give here a shout out to the to the co-chairs, uh, Daniela Lowenberg, who was a past chair, and also Ian Bruno from the Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center, who I see is in the audience, uh, for uh, coordinating this group. The objective here was really to try to crystallize the interest in the community in uh, having metrics that could help us uh, measure the impact of research data and at the same time recognizing the importance in this process in having reliable ways to count and report data usage at repositories. Obviously, the repositories are a key piece in this ecosystem. Um, I know that the working group uh, coordinated a number of uh, consultations and, and outreach with members of the community, also through RDA events, and they published the recommendations a couple of years ago. I listed some there, there are more details in the report, but essentially, uh, just to briefly summarize them, there was uh, recognition that there is a strong interest in this space, particularly in making sure that we have minimal, meaningful counts of views and downloads. But there is uh, this is complex, so there can be adoption barriers. There was also a, a recommendation to consider the tools that are already available to the through, in the community through different collaborative efforts that can help repositories normalize their accounts. For example, the counter code of practice and make data account recommendations. And then a reminder for everybody that we need to embrace uh, the fact that data usage is nuanced and we should not default to um, oversimplified metrics such as a data impact factor. This makes things more challenging, but I think we need to, as I mentioned, embrace the fact that we will have a diversity of uses for data as well as users, and we should reflect that in any metrics that we work on. So if we go to the next slide, I was going to mention the Make Data Count initiative that has already come up. And if you were paying attention to the earlier beautiful animation, you may remember that was created in 2015. This is a community effort with a goal to uh, promote the development and adoption of open data metrics. So again, we enable this in our, uh, evaluation of data usage and in turn reward those uses of data. Uh, at Make Data Count, we believe that having these transparent and meaningful uh, data metrics are important because we need them to make it possible to create incentives for data sharing and then create this harmonious cycle where there is more sharing and we can collect more usage and build on this understanding. Importantly, make this rewarding for researchers so that they can collect credit for uh, following best practices around sharing and citing data. And importantly, beyond the individual data sets, so individual evaluation of researchers, we it is important that we start to understand how and, and where and, and, and whether the benefits of open data are really materializing in terms of accelerating knowledge. So the Make Data Count, as I mentioned, is a community effort. I invite anybody interested to either visit the website or get in touch with me if you want to contribute. Uh, we operate in a number of areas trying to support the development of open infrastructure, where obviously data site is a key player, as well as uh, best practices co-created with the community and doing outreach to increase awareness about the importance of uh, a meaningful open data metrics. And in the next slide, I wanted to mention briefly a project that we are currently working on that sits very, uh, very much at the center of the Make Data Count initiative and relies very much on the relational metadata uh, that we we are collecting through data site, which is the global open data citation corpus. Uh, this is a project uh, funded by the Wellcome Trust, and the goal is to develop a comprehensive corpus that incorporates citations from different sources, so citations to data specifically from different sources so that we can create a single centralized resource that is available to the community to access and use this information. The idea is that the corpus will incorporate both the data citations that are already coming through the data site of data through the relational metadata that is collected by, but also citations from other sources that may be using different methodologies to identify 
data citation. So for example, by applying machine learning methodologies to the full text of articles, or so perhaps by having curation of those publications to identify citations to data. The idea is to try to bring it all together into a single resource. Oh, sorry, and I forgot if we can click, we can see the perhaps the, the dashboard. Um, hopefully it works. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Um, the idea is that we're bringing this all together to give a more comprehensive view of data usage for the community. We're still at the very early stages of the project, working on the prototype, but what you can see on the animation is an initial dashboard that we have built based on the citations that are uh, stored at the moment, again, based on those that are already coming through data site event data, as well as data citations that have been donated by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative that has been using machine learning tools to identify citations in a large corpus of full text articles. And with that, I think I may hand back to Kelly. Great, thank you so much, Rasha. Um, yeah, so I guess we're reaching the end of the session. Um, I wanted to wrap up by sharing a preview of what will be released in the next schema version, schema 4.5. Um, but at the same time, if folks have questions, please put those in the chat um, and we can start to address those as well. I will go quickly through this. So we've got time for questions too. So we're currently wrapping up implementation for schema 4.5. Um, the contents of which were finalized earlier this year following community consultation at the end of 2022. Um, and you can view the documentation online already um, at this DUI. Um, and this will resolve to our new web-based documentation hosted on Read the Docs. And so version 4.5 includes several changes, um, the first of which is support for instruments. Um, so as Lee mentioned earlier, we are adding a new resource type instrument described as a device, tool, or apparatus used to obtain, measure, and or analyze data. Um, an important use case for these instrument DOIs is representing relationships between instruments and the data they collect and vice versa. And so for this use case, we have added a new set of relation types is collected by and collects, which are primarily intended for these data instrument relationships. We've also updated the documentation to make sure the definitions and guidance are inclusive of instruments. Um, and again, as Lee mentioned, we added a new mapping to the schema for the PID and schema, showing the relationship between PID inst and data site metadata. The other resource type being added in schema 4.5 is study registration. Um, and as pre-registrations and register reports are really gaining traction for research reproducibility, um, we wanna support this growing practice. And so the new term study registration is meant to be inclusive of pre-registrations, register reports, registrations, other emerging output types in this area. And so the specific type of study registration can be specified in the free text resource type field here. Another change that is part of schema 4.5 is the addition of publisher identifiers. And so this is similar to how we support affiliation and funder identifiers. Um, the schema will soon support the inclusion of organization identifiers for publishers, um, such as raw IDs. And this is implemented through three new attributes added to the publisher property, all of which are optional, publisher identifier, publisher identifier scheme, and scheme URI. Um, and finally, there were also a handful of changes in the documentation for this version. Um, we updated the definition of physical object to be more inclusive of biological samples. Um, and specifically, we altered it to remove the inanimate qualification because not all samples are inanimate physical objects. Um, we also updated the related item subproperty definitions for clarity, um, added a new guidance document to this property with examples, including um, looking at the relationship between related item and related identifier. And finally, um, as you've seen from the links that Paul has put in the chat, we have revamped the documentation structure um, and format here by publishing on Read the Docs. Um, so before it was just a PDF document um, and we would put it on our support site as well. Um, we're hoping that this new primarily web-based documentation will be easier to use and reference for our members. So those are the 4.5 updates. So we're really thrilled to be able to share this with you soon. Um, we're also excited for what will come next for the schema. And so to make sure that versions beyond 4.5 continue to reflect the data site community's needs and interests, we really encourage everyone to share schema suggestions with us. Um, Paul's put some links in the chat so you can officially submit suggestions through the form. And we're also always happy to talk about schema through various other channels, the data site chat room on the PID forum, open hour sessions, anywhere you can find us, we're happy to talk about the schema. Um, and another important way to contribute is when we have requests for comments or RFCs, to um, 
comment on those and participate in that process. And so we anticipate one sometime in the first half of 2024, most likely, um, with some upcoming proposed changes. Um, and then finally, we also have an open call right now for getting involved with the metadata working group. So if you're interested in getting very involved with the schema, um, you can apply at the link that's been shared in the chat. Um, and that closes on November 27th, the deadline for applications. Right. And so, yeah, I guess that's all we have for you today. Um, got some time for questions. Um, thank you also to RDA for hosting this session. Um, and yeah, I'll hand over for questions if anyone's got any. Take a look at the chat too. Yeah, I think there's still a couple of questions in the chat. Sure. Let me, there's a lot of links from Paul too. So I'm trying to make sure I've got what's pending here. Um, okay, where would data management fit, plans fit under this? Um, so there is a resource type general for output management plans, which is being used for data management plans. It's a bit different than a registration. Um, and we're seeing that resource type primarily being used by, by DMP tool at the moment for their DMP DOIs. You have any other open questions that I've missed? Helena, did you see any? No, actually, I do think most things were also answered in the chat. I don't know if you want to highlight anything um, that's of particular yeah, interest. Can... Look at that. Um, so I think Alicia's question earlier about um, the is published in relationship and how that relates to other relation types is interesting. So um, yeah, for publication and data set relationships, if it's you know, something you would consider a citation or a reference, we would recommend the three pairs. So is cited by um, sites, is referenced by references, and is supplement to, is supplemented by. Um, is published in is more for container and containing relationships. So I think it was, we had the series information description type and we still have that, um, but that was sort of, if you're looking at, you know, a journal article in a journal or a book chapter in a book, how do you represent that container? And we realized that needed to have more structured fields in place. And so the related item property can be used for that with the is published in relation type to indicate that this is that container for a publication. Down, see if there's other ones here too. Um, Arasha, did you want to speak to the accession numbers on the? Yeah, um, sorry, I was all? typing, but I think it's yeah, going to be faster <laughs> if I speak. So thank you, Alisa, for the question. So as I explained, the way this works is that CCI um, collected a number of terms maintained by UPMC in terms of accessing numbers associated with a list of repositories and use those to, in terms of the information, they look through the model. They used to mine the, the text. But for the question as to whether the accession numbers will be recognized by data site, what I wanted to clarify is that the, the goal of having the corpus with different sources is that we wanted to make sure that we could start capturing the citations to data sets that have accession numbers and not DOIs, because we know that there are many repositories, particularly in the life sciences, that have a strong uh, tradition of sharing and they use accession numbers. I think that the, the the part of the question where I want to be more nuanced is that we recognize that that's a different type of source of a data citation, and we don't capture necessarily the same type as of metadata as everything that we can capture through the data site schema, which, as you have just heard, the last hour and a half is is very comprehensive. So part of what we are trying to, to work through in the corpus is making so that we are transparent as to the provenance of the, of the citation and how can we incorporate those sources in a meaningful way, again, because they don't cap capture the same metadata. But the idea is that once the corpus is finalized, it will be possible to also see the citations to the data sets that have accession numbers. <laughs> yeah, Great, thank you. Yeah, your comprehensive answer. Um, I'm just looking at the chat. Does anyone else have any other questions for us about the schema? Um, you can also be reached at support at dsite.org for any follow-up. Um, I'll put that in the chat as well. Um, it's on this slide too. Um, yeah, well, I guess we've got a minute left here. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, and thanks again to RDA for hosting. Um, we'll be posting the recording on our YouTube channel and the slides are already available on Zenodo. Um, yeah, 
please stay in touch with us and keep engaging with us about the schema. Thanks so much, everyone.